Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Mark Ebenier, and they actually made up a placard like you don't know who this is. <laughs> and I'll bet you can make even more noise for the best damn writer of science fiction and fantasy the world has ever seen. <laughs> How are you? I'm here. <laughs> with, with all my lovers. <laughs> how, how are you feeling? We're, we're, we all get concerned about you. We all we need to keep you around for a long time. It's not enough for the world to be immortal. We want the guy to live forever at the same time. So, you know, <laughs> okay. Uh, you've had a rough year in losing a few loved ones. We've all lost a couple of people we cared about this year. Have you had the urge this year to go to a carnival <laughs> instead? <laughs> I've had the urge to make a speech about Michael Moore. <laughs> Because the equipment is all around us. You see it everywhere. 
And, but in that story, you were kind of talking about the dangers of living in an environment like that. Do you think it's dangerous for people to be spending so much time in, in video games and virtual no. reality and computer generated? It, it, it's, everything depends on how you use the technology. The, Automobiles are wonderful devices for traveling, but if you if you don't handle them correctly, you're in trouble. So far, we've used the rocket to very good effect. We've gone to the moon. And we're heading out for Mars. We're going beyond Mars to Alpha Centauri. So so far, the rocket technology has been used very creatively. Do you think the space program these days is living up to what it should be? I want to read, let me read here. This is from this morning's press services. It announced yesterday, NASA and its space partners on Friday approved a scaled down international space station with fewer astronauts and less science so the United States could meet a 2010 deadline for ending space shuttle flights, a top NASA official said. Space agencies in Russia, Europe, Canada, and Japan gave unanimous approval to a NASA plan that means the orbiting platform, now about half completed, will never become the beehive of scientific and commercial research once envisioned. Do you think that America is making an adequate commitment to the space program in light of things like that? Let, let's put it this way. We're spending roughly a billion dollars a day on war. So. We could take one day a year and spend a billion dollars and send us to Mars with, a, with live people. So we're going to do it. All right. What? What's the step beyond? What's the next step after Mars? Not that we should be planning that now, but no, it's going to be a big jump. It's going to take a few hundred years to, to settle Mars, to colonize Mars, to make a base. Our first base is the moon, of course. We don't need a space station for that. A good, solid base on the moon. Then we get to Mars and establish a good, solid base then. Then eventually, 400 years from now, we head out for Alpha Centauri. And we hope, maybe, we don't know at this time, there may be a planetary system somewhere there where we can settle for another few thousand years. Huh? The, whole, the whole thing is this, the immortality of mankind, no matter what you think of us. Huh? This is the generation I describe as too soon from the cave, too far from the stars. <laughs> a few thousand years. We have a lot to forgive, but we have a lot to think about for the future. We're quite incredible creatures. We're quite a, we're impossible. Every time you see a special on TV that tries to guess at the generation of life on Earth, and at the end of the program, they simply don't know. It just happened, that's all. So, but I worked on a program at the Smithsonian a couple of years ago, they called me in to rewrite their planetarium show. They took me in the planetarium, sat me down, and within 10 minutes, all around me, people were asleep. Huh? You could hear snoring all through the planetarium. And we went back to the, the offices of the uh, officials at the uh, uh, planetarium, and the Smithsonian people said to me, what are we doing wrong? I said, my God, man, you're teaching instead of preaching. You shouldn't use a planetarium to teach us. You must preach to us. Because a planetarium is a holy place. It's a church. It's a synagogue. It's a cathedral where we go to worship time and space and humanity. It's even more special than our grandest churches because the whole universe is spread out before us. And we, we go to planetariums and we come out filled with awe and respect for our place in the universe. So I said, get out of the way and let me write you a new program. <laughs> because I, I want to inspire people. I don't want to teach them. I, if, if I inspire them, they'll go teach themselves. 
on the way out. They'll buy a book or they go to the library and, and borrow a book. That's the important thing. But I said, you people are dead on your feet here. Now, let me write you a new program. So I wrote a 32-page program called The Great Shout of the Universe, The Impossible Miracle of Life Creating Itself Throughout the Universe. I turned in my 32-page script and they sent back 28 pages of criticism. <laughs> I said, my God, I feel like I'm back at MGM. <laughs> this is the way I was treated at MGM and Paramount, Columbia, and all the other places. Everyone thinks they know what they're doing. So we kept arguing back and forth, and I wrote new pages. And I, they said, you're not very scientific. I said, that's the trouble with your show. You're trying to be scientific. You're trying to teach the pages, and that's not the way to do it. So I said, what's the one thing I've done here that you hate the most? They said, well, you got a thing in your script about the Big Bang Theory. I said, what did I say? They, they said, you said the Big Bang occurred 10 billion years ago. I said, when did it occur? <laughs> and they said, 12 billion years ago. Uh, I said, prove it. <laughs> said that, you know. <laughs> that was very impolite of me, and because nobody knows. So after a few weeks of arguing back and forth with the Smithsonian, I called them one day and I said, how much money do you owe me right now? They said, $17,000. I said, give me $7,000 and let me go, because this marriage is working. Uh, <laughs> you promised to behave, and you're not behaving. <laughs> And you're standing in front of me, and I can't see the stars. And so they let me go, and I came out to L.A., and I put the show in the Air and Space Museum down there. It's called Windows on the Universe. It's been playing upstairs there for about 20 years. But, but the one thing that got me to thinking when I was writing the script is the impossibility of the universe. It, it exists. 10 billion light years in one direction, 20, 20 billion light years in another, any direction that you go in. It's totally impossible. The Big Bang doesn't explain it. You have to have so much energy to create a universe that big that's 20 billion light years across. It's simply impossible. So I said to myself, what's a better theory? I said, wouldn't it be interesting if the universe has always been here? It never was created. It's always been there. Well, that's impossible too, isn't it? it? It staggers the imagination. It terrifies you to think that the universe has been here forever. There's only one missing element. We are the missing element. Huh? The universe is a theater. At a certain point in time, the theater was empty and it needed an audience. So we have been created as the audience. You are the audience to witness the miracle, to, to witness and to celebrate. That's our job, having been created as human beings in the world, as writers and artists and actors and ordinary human beings, to witness this fantastic thing and to celebrate it and to never forget your position in the universe. You are here to see and to know and to celebrate. And by the end of your life, you must give back what was given you. The miracle of life, the strange exhilaration of discovering every morning that you are alive, huh? and you have an obligation then to the universe to pay back, huh? to pay back.